Hey guys, this is Pastor Jeff. I want to welcome you to Christ Church of the Valley this weekend. I, I can't think of a, a better place to be than right here where you are. I'm in Thailand at the moment, and I'm having the opportunity to, to preach the good news of the gospel to some unreached people groups, and that's a, that's a thing very close to my heart. But Josh Wolford is here. Josh has been great. He's my research assistant, but also has become a, one of our teaching pastors here. He's got a great message, so would you give Josh Wolford a great CCV warm welcome as he comes out to deliver today's message. All right. Good morning, CCV. How are we doing today? Doing good? All right. We do want to welcome everyone. We want to welcome all of our campuses, uh, our online campus. But I want to give a warm welcome, especially this week, to our Lone Hill campus. Man, Lone Hill, man, we love you. You have such a reputation of being a strong community and full of servants. So just thank you for what you do over there. Uh, so we're just excited to jump in the Word today. We're going to be in Mark chapter 10, uh, starting with verse 17. You could turn there, and as you do, I want to relate to you a news story. Last week, Pastor Jeff shared a very inspiring story. And so, man, that was amazing, and it really moved us. And I thought this week I would do the exact opposite and tell a really uninspiring story from the news. Okay, so uh, right near the, the hills of, um, of uh, Nevada, there's the University of Nevada. And so on the hills, for the last hundred years, there's big, uh, been a big, huge N on the hill that stood for the University of Nevada. They, they made it a hundred years ago out of white rocks. It's kind of like the big A that we have in Azusa. So in Nevada, they've got this big N that everyone can see, but out of nowhere, the news reported that, that a big A appeared to the end. This like, this A made out of chalk. You can see a picture of it here. Kind of crooked and just kind of faint and, and no one knew where the heck this thing came from. Finally, one guy came forward and said, it was me. Kind of sheepishly like, yeah, that was me. His name was Brent Wilbur here. And, and he basically says, you know, on a moonless night, I, I rented a, ch- a truck. I bought a pallet full of marking chalk and, and I went up there and, and I wrote an A and I was actually going to write two other letters, a T and an I. I, I was trying to write the name Tina. You see, I I had this ex-girlfriend, and I don't want her to be my ex-girlfriend anymore. I want to win her back, and I owe her a great many apologies for the way I treated her, but uh, I got up there, and I just ran out of steam. (laughs) They asked him, you know, do you have any regrets? And he said, no, man, uh, I don't care if I get in trouble with the authorities or whatever, because I love her. The problem is, he only one letter loved her. (laughs) Guys, by the way, if you, uh, gentlemen, if you're trying to win back your girlfriend and her name's like Mary Elizabeth or something like that, just figure out something else because that's 13 letters. It ain't going to happen. My wife's name is Christy, and that's six letters. I six letter love you over there, Christy. I six letter love you. But hopefully I never have to do anything like that. (laughs) Look, this guy couldn't even do three letters. That N was already there. Do you think he won Tina back? No, right? No, by no means. The question is, when it comes to our spiritual lives, our relationship with God, do you ever feel like, man, you're trying, you come to church, you read the Bible, and, 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 and you, you even show up to serve sometimes, and you try to pray, but there's just so many distractions, or maybe you're just running out of steam, you know, we're going we're gonna to get into a story of the Bible today where Jesus comes across someone who's really trying. He's really trying, but something's blocking him from truly being all in. And so he finds himself kind of deflated, kind of like with all this chalk, but not being able to write out all the letters. And so that's the story we see in Mark chapter 10. And so uh, before we get into this, we need to see that Jesus is in Judea. That's the region that he's teaching in. And so he's teaching, he's doing some teaching, and then all of a sudden there's just interesting little story where these kids come up to Jesus and the disciples try to stop them, but it's revealing about the character of Jesus that he wants to see them, but it's more revealing about the nature of who Jesus was because the kids were okay seeing him, right? Because kids have a built-in barometer of who's stuffy, who's lame. If you've ever seen kids, man, they just don't want to go around someone who's not going to treat them with energy and excitement. And so doesn't that reveal something about the nature of Jesus? And so he's enjoying this time with them, but in the back of Jesus' mind, he knows that something's waiting for him. Mark 10, 17 says he's about to set out on his journey. His journey is to Jerusalem. 
That's where he's going. That's where we see he goes right after this story that we're about to dive into. Jerusalem is waiting. And just like last week's sermon, a place can be a geographical location, but it can also be a symbol. And so Jesus knows that this this place, Jerusalem, is not too far away, but as a symbol, it's the furthest journey anyone can travel because every step towards Jerusalem is a step towards Jerusalem the cross. And so Jesus has this in the back of his mind. At one point in the book of Luke, it describes that Jesus, when he, when he feels called, that it, he literally sets his face to Jerusalem. He's feeling this calling to go, the stirring inside of him. He doesn't really want to go, but he knows he has to go. And so he's about to go about on his journey. He sets out on his journey, but before he can go, an interesting thing happens. This young man comes running up to Jesus. And according to the Bible, according to this culture and context, a young person, just so we get an understanding of, of who this is running up to him, a young person was technically between the ages of 24 and 40. 24 and 40. So if you're in this room uh, and you're between 24 and 40, the Bible says you're young. You are young. Uh, everyone who's older than 40, I'm not saying anything about your status. I'm just saying according to the Bible, technically you're the opposite of young. I'm not saying that. It's the Bible. So uh, this, this young man comes up, and the Bible tells us that he's a man of great means. He's a very wealthy guy. He's also a ruler. And so he's a man of great reputation, and he comes running up, which would have been the strangest thing you've ever seen if you were in this context, because if you were a man of importance, you did not go running to anyone. They came running to you. And so first he diminishes his reputation by running, and then he demolishes his reputation by kneeling before. Jesus. And before you think that they were just more demonstrative back then, no, this would have been a completely just this huge event in this community. Like, what is going on? And the people this time, they would have been like unloading a cart or something, and they would have just stopped and been like, what is he going to say? A mom would be with her kids, and, they, and the mom would just cup the mouths of the kids and say, Shh, be quiet, I want to hear. What is he going to say to Jesus? He falls at his feet. And so this guy, with all this pressure, with all these eyeballs on him, this, he has this immense, like, possible embarrassment, but he doesn't care. He needs to know something. And he cries out with an almost desperation, uh, verse 17b, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Something tells this guy that there's something about Jesus, that he has the answers to his just most deepest penetrating questions. And this guy, he's a rich young ruler. He's not a political ruler. He's actually a religious ruler. So he knows the law. He's in church all day, every day, but he knows that deep down, something Something is wrong. He needs answers. He looks at Jesus and he sees something flowing out of Jesus that he doesn't have. He sees love. He sees righteousness. He sees life that he doesn't have. And so he says, what must I do? He cries out with desperation. And Jesus responds with, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone which is sort of a troubling response in my mind. When I first read it, I just turning this over like, wait, is, is he saying don't call me this, only call God that? That's confusing because we believe in the Trinity. We believe in the divinity of Jesus. What, what's going on here? It's important to note that Jesus does not say don't call me that. He doesn't say don't call me that. He says, why? What, this, what Jesus is doing, he's challenging this guy to confront in his mind who it is exactly he really thinks Jesus is. Jesus is saying, I am divine. I want you to really recognize that as you speak to me because your understanding of who I am is going to vastly dictate the rest of this conversation and the rest of your life. And that's a message to you and me. Who is it that you really think that I am as you go about your life and as you pray to me? Who is it? Are, do you really call me good? Do you understand how good I am? And so I imagine Jesus would have just almost paused here for a moment as well, letting this sink in with this guy. And then he actually answers his question directly. But he does so in another kind of unexpected way. Verse 19, he says, You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He lists some, but not all, of the Ten Commandments. 
which is kind of strange because this guy's asking for eternal life. And Jesus has on his mind the cross, the only inevitable way towards salvation. Why doesn't he point him to what he's about to do? Why does he point him back to the commandments? It's kind of an interesting question. Well, N.T. Wright is a genius scholar, and many other scholars believe it's because people of this time thought differently than the way you and I do often. Today, when it comes to religion, we're wrapped up with this idea that it's all about just what happens after this life, as long as we punch our ticket and get in. But that's not the way they were thinking back then. They knew that life was precious and that God gave us one life here and now to live and to live righteously and to live it well, to live an eternal kind of life now. That's why Jesus prays, may it be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's why Jesus says, I did not come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it, to bring life to it, to show you that it's the way to live. It's the way to walk about in freedom. That's why in one, uh, Psalm 119, it says, I will walk about in freedom for I have sought out your precepts. Jesus is saying, look, if you want a life well lived, if you want to live eternal kind of life now, God has set out these precepts already. Live within the confines of the Bible and the way God has taught you to live, and you will live a good eternal kind of life now. Now, to be very clear, to be exactly clear, the only way you can really stand before God and be righteous and pure is through Jesus and through following him. And this guy, he's going to get that specific invitation in a few verses. But for now, this guy's swirling around in his mind with this answer of the following the commandments. And he says to him in verse 20, teacher, I've kept all of these things from my youth. And we can't get in this guy's mind, but you got to imagine that he's thinking, I've been keeping these things, and yet I still don't have the eternal kind of life that I know deep down inside that I need to have. Jesus, that's not working for me. And Jesus knows this. He knows that there's something in the way. And so Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, you lack one thing, Mark 10, 21. Now stop right there. Before we get to that one thing, we just need to stop and look at these two words, loved him. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Can you imagine what that look would have looked like? I hope that recently, very recently, you've gotten a look from someone else that they didn't even have to say words, but you could just feel love in their eyes. Man, it's my hope that you feel that and you have that in your life. And this guy had that look from Jesus. Jesus is letting this guy know, man, I'm about to confront you on something, about to raise an issue in your life that's going to be really hard to confront with, but I want to make sure you know that this is underwritten in a deep love. And so he looks at him with love, and he says, there's one thing you lack. Jesus knows the, the depth inside of us, what's going on. He knows the sin. He knows the turmoil. He knows the things that we put first before him. There's no sense in hiding it. He knows it in this guy's life, and he knows it in ours, but he does underwrite it in love. But make no mistake, he knows all of our stuff. And if you've been hiding something, if you've been pushing it down inside of you, just get it out, man. Confess it to God because he knows already, and you are going to get found out. I read a story about this guy in the news who got found out. You see, he got in trouble with the law and he was trying to evade having to go to court. And so he and his wife cooked up the scheme together to fake an illness, that he was a quadriplegic in a coma. And so they even like took pictures and everything of it. So here's a picture of this guy. And so this is fake. This is completely fake. And so this wife, look at her sad look. Oh, my poor husband in a coma. And so the court kind of catches on that this guy's faking it. And so they send the subpoena saying, no, you have to literally go to court. They wheel him in and they like put on the full display that he's not doing so well. The problem is once they get into court, they reveal they have images and video of him walking around. So that's him right there. And so there's this moment in court where they do that and then he just pleads guilty. It's like he like comes back to life. You know, he wipes off the fake drool off of his chin and says, yeah, I did it. One person wrote in the comment section of this story, once they found out that he was faking it, they should have messed with them first. Poked him in the leg with a fork a few times. Or say, oh no, there's a fire, leave him. We gotta get out of here and just see what he does. This guy faked it for two years. And we judge him for that, right? I mean, what, what a moron, right? But at least he got away with it for two years. 
That's better than what you and I do with God because he knows immediately what our issues are. He knows immediately what this man's issue is in his life and he's about to call him out on it. He tells this guy one thing you lack. Verse 21, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. In other words, he broke the very first commandment. You shall not have any gods before me. This guy had an idol in his life, and it was stuff, and it was possessions. And his response, after running to Jesus, after seeing the look of love in his eyes, he went away, verse 22, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. One of the saddest verses in the whole Bible, because this guy really wanted to know Jesus. He really wanted to follow him. He really wanted eternal life, but he couldn't walk away from his stuff, so he ends up walking away from Jesus. And and the Bible uses two words to describe how he was feeling, disheartened and sorrowful. Could have used any two words to really describe this. There's a plethora of words, but Mark uses these two specific words to paint a picture for us, because the first word has to do with a disheartenedness, a sorrowfulness that is actually given to him. You, You would think that he would just feel that as a natural reaction to his choice, excuse me, to his choices, But no, it's actually something that was given to him by God. This word literally means to cause grief, to make someone uneasy, causing second thoughts. This was a gift. This grief was a gift from God to this man so that he would feel the weight of his decision and so that he would turn around and come back. But he doesn't come back. And so he feels this weight, this grief, this sorrow. And I just got to ask Is there grief and sorrow in your life? I mean, sometimes we know that that grief just comes from maybe losing someone, something that's completely out of your control, and that's, that's different. But this specific form of grief is a weight on your soul, knowing deep down inside you know it's because you've done something that you shouldn't do, you've got something in your life that shouldn't be there, and God has given you this beautiful gift of grief so that you would turn around and come to him. If you have a spiritual sadness or weight on you, and you feel like something's not right, pay attention to that. God is trying to get your attention. God is trying to speak to you. But if you don't, and you keep walking that way, it's going to come out in your life, it's going to come out in your relationships, it's going to come out in your prayer life, and you are going to continually walk into the next Greek word to explore here, stugnazo, which literally is this like painting kind of word. He's painting a picture of what this guy's walking into, because it literally means like walking into gloominess or a storm. And so what Mark is saying is that he was with Jesus in the light, just being close with the source of life, and he chooses to walk away and walks into darkness, which for me is really the the scary part of the story. Because you could run to Jesus, you could kneel to Jesus, you could spend time with him, you can even hear him and see his love, but you could still walk away from him in grief and sorrow if you don't get this one thing out of your life that's keeping you from being all in. In Scripture, this is the only man, the only person who fell at the feet of Jesus and walked away worse off because he was just not willing to give this thing up. He was not expecting that high of a demand. I believe that we all have one thing in our life that's distracting us, at least one thing that's keeping us from loving Jesus more and more and feeling his connectedness. We live in a fallen world. There's all kinds of distraction. There's all kinds of sin. And we don't always explore what's going on inside of us. There's one thing. I'm telling you, there's at least one thing that you need to get out of your life so that you can be as close to Jesus as possible to be all in. And you may know what this is. You may have been struggling with this for years. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's, maybe it's something that you just cannot, it was easy to grab hold of, but hard to let go. As Jeff preached a sermon a few years ago, actually, and that phrase just sticks with you. Some things are easy to grab hold of, but hard to let go. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's, maybe it's your reputation. You're just so concerned about what other people think about you. Maybe it's your past. Something has happened to you, and you can't let go of it, and so you think about that. You, you put that, that affects you more than anything else. Maybe that's become your idol in your life. Literally, anything can become an idol in your life if you're putting it before God. 
And so Jesus is calling for an eradication of this in your life. He's calling for an eradication in this guy's life. He doesn't come along to this rich young ruler and say, all right, kid, I hope you kind of work on this as we go about our way. I hope you give it the old, you know, good, good try. No, Jesus says, go, be gotten rid of this stuff because it's killing you. It's, it's, it's keeping you from me. And if you think he's being harsh with this guy, you're right. He is. Because this, for Jesus, is a love relationship. This is harsh because he knows it's keeping him from. Imagine a husband comes to a wife and says, I had an affair. And the wife says, okay, I'll take you back. You know, it's never that simple. But imagine, she says, I'll take you, I'll take you back. You could just never see that woman again. And then the guy goes, well, I'll try really hard to not see her so much. No way, right? It's got to be an eradication. You've got to do your best. Now, that husband might still struggle with some temptation or lust or some issue in his life. He doesn't have to be perfect in his sexuality and his purity, but he has to be doing everything he can to eradicate, to never see that woman again, and to walk the line that's towards his wife and to be committed. And so Christ, he's not expecting this guy to get over all of his issues right away, but he's saying, go and do something drastic. Do something that shows to me that you're serious about this relationship. Wake up, do something, eradicate it. When, when uh, my wife and I first bought our house, we realized that we had termites in the house. And I was just so brokenhearted over this. I, I didn't realize how common termites were. I, I thought, like, my house had a death sentence. And so uh, we called up a friend. He said, no, it's okay, man. Like, that's every house in California. So just call the exterminator. And I said, okay. And so that's, man, inside of me, I was so excited because I was going to do whatever it took. Pay, uh, do, spray stuff. I don't care. I need to get this out of my house because from the insides out, it's chewing it up. It might look okay from the outside, but I know deep down it's hurting. It's hurting the structure. And so I'll do whatever it takes. The, the, the analogy here is, look, if you've got something in your life that's eating away with you, you've got to get it out you got to get it out. And if the termites come back, I'm going to call and exterminate them right away again, right? And so if you've got something in your life, you do something drastic. Jesus is calling you to action, and it may come back. You may still struggle with it, but that's where Jesus' beautiful invitation to this man comes next. And this man doesn't realize how beautiful this next part is because he says, go and sell everything. But in the same breath, he says, and follow me. He's saying, this is going to be the hardest thing that you will ever do. But have this invitation about your mind as you do it, that you have this invitation to follow me and I will empower you. I will show you the way. This could be hard. This will be hard. It may even seem impossible, but I will, I will show you. Follow me. Don't let anything get in the way of your relationship with me. And so for many of you, you know there's something you've been struggling with it. And to be honest with you, as I was writing this sermon, I was really struggling with this idea because I know that there's something getting in my way of, of my relationship with God. I, I think there's something for all of us. And as I'm praying and sitting and thinking about it, turning it over in my mind, I'm asking God, what is it in my life? Uh, there's no egregious one thing that keeps coming to my mind. I couldn't think of what it is. I said, God, show me what it is. I'll get rid of it. And God didn't show me. And, but what he did tell me was, Josh, I want you to wrestle with this. If I just give you the information, you'll know what it is, and then maybe you'll just check it off your list and do it. I want you to focus on me. I want you to wrestle with really what's going down deep inside of you. I want you to be real with who you are and get to the core of your issues, which is a lot harder, and I'm really kind of disappointed he didn't just tell me. I wish I could just know, but I'm going to have to wrestle with God through this. And so maybe that's you. Maybe you've been a Christian for 50 years. Something's in your way. Wrestle with God. Do whatever it takes. Go to counseling. Get your community around you. Ask questions. But the one way that I'm convinced that God's going to speak to me is through the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 puts it like this. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. What this passage is telling you, that if you've got something in your intentions, your heart, that's not right, if you read the scriptures and let them come to life, uh, man, he will speak to you. It will pierce you. You will know. If you're asking the questions and asking God to speak to you, he will. He will reveal it. And so in, in my coming quiet times, I'm going to be asking God, God, what's getting in my way? I want to hear from you. Will you speak to me? 
If you know something's keeping you from God, I just want to invite you along in my journey of trying to figure out what that is because we don't want anything keeping us from being all in with Christ. And once he does reveal it to you, he's going to ask you to do something, to do something bold, to do something hard. And, and, and if once you realize that you've got this thing, maybe this secret, he's going to ask you to give that up and to go and tell someone that's going to be hard so you can walk about in freedom. He's going to maybe ask you to give up your need to be right all the time so that you can have peace in your life. He's going to maybe ask you to give up social media. If you're on your phone 19 hours out of the day, that you don't have space, that becomes an idol in your life, or maybe it's TV. I just read recently that the average person spends nine years of their life watching TV. Do you think God, when he sees us in heaven, goes, hey, maybe that was an idol in your life. You worshiped that thing for nine years. N not that I'm going to go and throw away my TV or anything, but I do want to take it seriously, this idea of how do we use our time? What's consuming us? What's become an idol in our life that we didn't even realize it was? Maybe it's this job. Maybe you need to go find a lesser paying job that's, that's not consuming who you are. Maybe you need to break up your boyfriend and girlfriend. I don't know what it is in your life, but Jesus does. And if you wrestle with him long enough, he's going to reveal it to you. And then he's going to ask you to set it aside. And you might not know it's an idol until he asks you to set it aside and then it really cuts deep. And then you know, I don't, I don't want to give that up because I'm putting that too high in my priority list. One woman wrote that God called her to give her singleness and desire for marriage over to him because she had put that above his love for her in her life. God wants all of you. And he's not going to ask all of us to sell all of our possessions and give it to the poor. That's not a universal command. But the universal command is put him first. And God's going to make you wrestle with whatever it is that's holding you back from being all in. And so for some of us, it's going to be hard work. It's going to be deep down inside of us. We're going to have to wrestle with things that we don't want to. And we may even think, man, there's no way I can give that up. I, there's just no way I can get over that. It feels impossible. And Jesus really highlights this impossibility. In Mark 10, 23, 24, he says, and Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. What Jesus is doing, he's trying to get them to see that this guy had this issue. And man, if he tries to tackle it alone, it's going to be very, very difficult. This passage has caused a lot of consternation for people who have a certain amount of money, uh, whatever that certain amount is, I don't know. But the issue is not so much the amount of money, but it's the identity that you have attached to that money. You know, the question is, do you own your stuff or does your stuff own you? Are you generous? Are you seeking the kingdom of God first? Or are you just trying to accumulate and desire? Because if that's true, if you're just trying to accumulate and accumulate more and more stuff, then you're like this guy. And it's going to be hard for you to, to stand before God rightly one day. In fact, it's going to be impossible. And so Jesus goes on to underscore and to highlight this shock. And he says, but Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Modern day analogy, it would be easier for a politician to be honest. It's just a, a way to explain an impossibility. And they were exceedingly astonished. And then they said, who can be saved? They're so astonished because at that time, they really believed that the wealthiest were the most blessed. That God loved them, so he gave them stuff. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. And so they were astonished. They didn't know what was going on. They were like, man, if this guy can't get over his issues, how can we get over our issues? And God, what does it mean to be blessed? And they're just, they're desperate at this point. They finally got into the place that the rich young ruler was at. Like desperate, like almost on their knees. And they yell out, who can be saved? And then that's where Jesus, I imagine, like, it's like finally they asked the question that I've been waiting for. He wanted them to see how hopeless it was without him. We feel hopeless sometimes, right? When we think about our addiction, we think about our greed, we think about our lust, we think about whatever it is, our darkness, the stuff that we don't want to tell anyone else. And if we think about that for too long, we can get hopeless. We can feel like that storm has come already and already stolen all of our light. And it appears to be beyond broken and gone into shattered. How can it ever be made whole again? Well, I'm here to tell you that's when Christ does his 
best work. That's when he comes in and says, with man, it is impossible, but not with God. Oh man, that's a big but right there. I had a professor who said, I want to write a a book called The Big Butts of the Bible. The idea here is, man, he's saying that there's something that's impossible. It is impossible, but not with God. Not with God. Jesus is trying to get us to see that if we add up all of our issues and we mountain it up together with our our need for control, our issues, everything, our sin, our darkness, it is impossible to get over that mountain and get to God. With man, it is impossible, but not with God. Jesus continues, all things are possible with God. How many things? All things are possible with God. Any miracle is possible. Sometimes I meet people and they'll they'll say to me like, yeah, you know, I see you're a Christian pastor. I believe in God. I just don't believe in like miracles and things like that. I just don't think that's possible. And then I say to them like, okay, so you can grant me this idea that there's a God and he created the universe and he spoke it into existence and he has dominion over all of it. And he, he, he invented the idea of atoms, but he can't manipulate them. He can't change them. You don't think that he has dominion over them. Do you know how easy it was for God to part the Red Sea? He was just like, and it was done. He could do whatever he wants to. He's God. And so with God, all things are possible. And when we look at our mountain of junk and we look at our issues, we look at our broken marriages that we are putting in front of God, we look at anything that we put in front of God and that has a hold on us and we think we can't let that go. There's too much darkness. I've held on to this too long. And if you try to rip that out of your chest, it's going to be impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Would you just say that with me? All things are possible with God. And as you search around deep inside of you in your mind and you think of the things that are dark inside of you and the things that hold you back from God, just remember, you can't do it alone. But with God, all things are possible. And before you think I'm just trying to cheerlead you and encourage you and that it's just like this like yippy moment, I want you to think about the depth of this phrase. Because Jesus didn't just use this as like a, a, that kind of a moment. He uses this phrase again just a few chapters later in Mark 14. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is feeling the weight of the world on his shoulders, and he knows what's coming. And so Jesus prays, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will, Father. And what does God will? for darkness to ensue, for the worst thing that's really ever happened in humanity. Our Savior was killed and tortured and beaten. And it's the darkest hour. There's a literal darkness there and a spiritual darkness. And can you imagine what the disciples would have been feeling as they looked at their Messiah and he's being beaten, beaten, flogged, crucified, and then he breathes his last and they put him in the tomb. That is the darkest they could have felt. And they had to endure all Saturday and everything. And if we're enduring death in our lives, man, it could feel completely hopeless. But let me point out, that's when God does his best work. And God answers and he says, yes, all things are possible. And he brings Jesus back to life. And he says, man, I'm inviting you into that story. That same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. And if you tap into that, nothing can hold you back. All things are possible. Resurrection can happen inside of you. Death can be defeated. Jesus comes back inside of you, back to life. And Jesus is inviting us all to go in deeper. He's inviting us to go and love him more. And it might be hard, but it's possible. With God, all things are possible. And with him... He's worth it. Peter asks at the end of the story, he says, you know, we've given up everything for you. You know, it's sort of a question of like kind of what's in it for us. And Jesus responds, you will receive, Mark 10, 30, a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. And so Jesus says, man, it's going to be hundredfold. And in the Bible, we know that numbers are important. So a hundred is like 10 times 10, right? And so 10 is the number for just completeness. 
And so Jesus is saying it's completeness times completeness. In your life, if you give up the way of the world and seek me, it's not like you're going to live this awful existence you're going to have. He he states them out here. Houses and brothers and sisters and children and lands. He's, He's giving this picture, not these things necessarily literally every one of them, but what he's saying is it's a life that will be complete upon complete. I will give you peace and joy and purpose and community And you will have a life that is good. You will have an eternal kind of life now. Not to say that there won't be persecutions. Jesus is very clear. He says there will be persecutions. But then we also have the age to come to look forward to with no persecutions, no tears, no hurts, no mourning. Everything is the way it's supposed to be. We have something now we can rejoice in as well as something to look forward to one day. And so whatever it is in your life that's holding you back from Jesus, from being all in, man, I'm begging you, get this thing out of your life. My one fear is that, that because we do this so often today, that we feel like we're supposed to do things, and so you're going to just kind of try to work on this issue, and, and because some pastor told you to do it or something, my hope is, no, you would have eyes to see that God loves you so much, and so that this would be a motivation of love, not some checklist, that you couldn't be held back from getting this thing out of your life so you could be as close to him as possible. I'm reading this book right now about Michelangelo, the artist, and it's, it, this book is kind of painting the picture of what he would have been feeling, what he would have been thinking, based on the, the actual events of his life. And so th- it describes a period of Michelangelo's life when he's, he's being apprenticed to, to do sculpture. He's going to do sculpture, but something's holding him back, and that is his, his masters don't think he's ready yet. But he has such a love for his art and for this, for this idea of sculpture that he goes out and steals marble. He goes out and steals this chunk of marble, and he puts it before him, and as he's about to take his chisel to it. He just stops and looks at it and reveres it. Michelangelo loves this so much, and he says this, this art, this, this stone even, it's like coming to life already in his mind. And as he's about to, to take chisel to it, there's a voice in the back of his head that says, this is love. This is love. And so for you, as you think about your relationship with God, it's not that you're just supposed to go and do a bunch of stuff or that you have this checklist to do. My prayer is that as you think about your relationship with God, that some voice would come alive in the back of your mind that this is love, that you would look at him the way Jesus looked at the rich young ruler with eyes of love, and you wouldn't let anything hold you from being all in with him. If you're in this room, and you're a Christian, look at him with love. Do whatever it takes. If you're in this room and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, man, I just want to let you know that he's inviting you into a better story. The world is going to try to sell you on a whole lot of stuff that will supposedly make you happy, but deep down inside, you already know that's not working. You put something in front of God, it's not going to satisfy you. And God's inviting you into a story And he's inviting you to be all in. And it's not an easy life. I'm not going to try to tell you that. But it's worth it. He will give you hundredfold rewards. And you will feel complete for the first time in your life. And so God is inviting you into that story. My prayer for all of us is that we would be like the man in the beginning of the story. We run to him. We kneel before him. We ask life's most penetrating questions to him. But my prayer is that we don't finish the way that that man finished by walking away. We would submit to him and follow him for the rest of the days of our life. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, for who you are and for your love. We thank you, Lord, that you are able to do all things. And so as we wrestle with what's keeping us from you, God, would you reveal it? Would you show us your love? Would you empower us along the way? And would you continue to teach us as we follow you? Lord, help us to be all in. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, at this point in the service, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our campus pastors to close out. And for us here, the last thing I want to do is just have you all stand with me. Um, Man, this is going to be a journey for you. Some of you, this is going to be difficult for you to really wrestle with this one thing in your life, or maybe it's a couple of things. And so I just want to just kind of give you a last benediction as you go out and be on your way. And before we do that, I just want to let you know we have a, a prayer team up here. 
after service, feel free to come on up and get a word of prayer because we want to be that kind of church that we are a praying church. But may you go out this week and realize that God has eyes of love for you. And he's calling you into something deeper, but he's, and he may even challenge you. But remember, he has eyes of love for you. May you go out and have eyes of love for him. And as you wrestle through these things, may you not do it alone. May you go out in community. May you uh, be a part of CR or a small group or whatever it takes. Put your arm around someone and walk through this together. May you take bold action so that nothing keeps you from our Savior. May you be all in. We love you. We're behind you. One hope, one life. God bless you. We'll see you next week.